Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Um, we'll get started in a few minutes, um, but thank you for joining us this evening. Hi, for those who just joined, thank you and welcome. Um, we're gonna get started in about one minute. Just wanna get as many folks in as possible and then we'll begin. So thank you again. Okay, let's get started. Um, thank you again and welcome to tonight's webcast. Uh, my name is Danielle Moser and I'm the Wildlife Program Coordinator for Oregon Wild. Uh, and for those who are new to our webcast series or new to our organization, Oregon Wild is a nonprofit organization uh, focused on protecting and restoring our state's wildlands, wildlife and waters for our current and future generations. Um, as the wildlife program coordinator, I obviously work on wildlife related issues. Um, specifically, we're working to ensure that we have robust and thriving wildlife, fish and wildlife species all across Oregon. Um, in particular, we focus on those that are imperiled at keystone species such as sea otters, beavers, wolves, um, and other uh, really important species that help hold up and keep our ecosystems healthy and intact. Um, of course, this work cannot be done without the support of passionate folks like you, uh, whether you're advocating for uh, more protections for wild and scenic rivers, defending old growth forests, or being a voice for our state's wildlife, uh, we really appreciate it. So if you'd like to learn more about our work, please do visit OregonWild.org, and you can also sign up for our newsletter. Um, so to welcome you all to this webcast, I'm happy uh, that our guest for the evening, Sarah Rose, uh, was available and is joining us. Uh, Sarah is the project manager with Oregon State University's Northwestern Hub for Bat Population Research and Monitoring. In her current position, Sarah has served as field technician, excuse me, field technician, crew lead, biologist, and spotted bat volunteer coordinator and is working on establishing long-term bat monitoring sites across the Pacific Northwest. Sarah received her BS from um, Oregon State University, Cascades uh, in Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife Conservation. Before joining the team at the OSU HERS lab, she completed la wildlife research internships with the Deschutes National Forest and with the Cardiff University at their research center in Malaysia and Borneo. Um, so before we begin and with her presentation on the mysterious world of spotted bats, um, I do want to go over just a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you're having trouble with the presentation or Zoom's being uh, finicky, just try closing out entirely and then logging back in with the link that Zoom sent you just before this webcast. Uh, if you have any questions for Sarah uh, for her presentation, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A box at any time. Um, we have time at the end of this event for question and answers, but don't hesitate to pop them in there early so that we don't have a huge rush at the end that I try to sift through. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier. And if you'd like a recording of this webcast, it will be emailed out tomorrow and posted to our website, OregonWild.org in the wild blog section. And finally, if you got a raffle ticket for tonight, thank you so much for your support. This allows us to continue doing these webcast presentations and just the work we do generally. Um, so the raffle will be open through this evening. So if you decide you want to buy one, you can still go uh, and get one by going on our website and finding this event 
Um, and then the winners will be selected tomorrow and contacted via email to verify shipping addresses. So thank you again. Um, and then finally, before I hand it over to Sarah, I do want to just take a moment to kind of ground this event and acknowledge and pay respect uh, to the indigenous people who have stewarded this land and been caretakers of wildlife and water since time immemorial. For me specifically tonight, I'm calling in from Portland, which is the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Kalapuya, Wasco, Molala, Cowlitz, and Walala bands of the Chinook and many other tribes who made and still make their homes near the confluence of the Columbia River and Willamette River. Um, so thank you again for joining us. And Sarah, I'd like to turn it over to you now. All right, thank you so much, Danielle. Let's get this going. One moment while I get squared away. There we are. All right. Well, I am going to be talking to you folks tonight about our Spotted Bat project, which was a citizen science endeavor um, over the last two summers, 2019 and 2020. Um, first, a little bit about who all comprised this project. Um, so as mentioned, I work for the HERS lab. That is the Human and Ecosystem Resiliency and Sustainability Lab. And that is co-run by um, Oregon State University Cascades and the National Park Service. Within the HERS lab, I work for the Northwestern Hub for Bat Population Research and Monitoring. Um, most of the time I work for them. I jump around. Um, but the, the Northwest Bat Hub, as we like to shorten it to, tries to um, serve as kind of a center of gravity for Pacific Northwest bat research and like broad scale um, bat monitoring. So we work with a lot of agency partners um, the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the entire alphabet soup of agencies, along with a lot of um, nonprofits and NGOs, um, to make sure that bat monitoring is being done kind of consistently and thoroughly across the Pacific Northwest. Um, we send teams of researchers out in Oregon, Idaho, and Washington, um, and sometimes Northern California. Um, for this project, I served as the volunteer coordinator following in the footsteps of my coworker Trent Hawkins, who got things started back in 2019. Um, and kind of the other side of the human element of this project were our volunteers who were kind enough to donate their time and energy um, to this project, which we greatly appreciate. Um, so before we jump into kind of the nitty gritty of the project and citizen science in general, I want to talk to you a little bit about the subject at hand, the spotted bat, um, often called the most elusive bat in Oregon, um, probably the most elusive bat in most of its range. Um, so spotted bats are fairly unique. We have about 15 species of bats here in the Pacific Northwest and about half of those are myotis or the mouse-eared bats. And they are fairly small, brown. Um, honestly, even if you've got them real up close, it's very hard to tell them apart. Um, and then the other half of our bats are a little bit more distinctive, but the spotted bat really stands out um, for a few reasons. It is on the larger side, um, as far as our local bats go, they can have a wingspan of up to 14 inches. They've got these really beautiful big pink ears, um, nice soft furred white belly, um, and then a simple nose. They have what I like to refer to as puppy face. Um, so some bats have really complicated faces and frills and crazy nostrils. These guys are, are fairly simple and just absolutely adorable. Um, if you flip them right on over, you've got those namesake polka dots, um, a nice long tail, as you can see here, um, and that is connected to the hind legs with this piece of skin called the uropatagium, which aids in flight and maneuverability. Um, spotted bats belong to a group called Vespertilionidae. Um, those are the Vesper bats or the evening bats, um, and their species name is Euderma maculatum. They are 
I would call them very dramatic creatures. They really enjoy the dramatic landscapes, the super, super dry parts of Western North America, the sage steppe, desert scrub, um, the dry forests, particularly um, ponderosa forests and juniper woodlands. Um, and they are particularly partial to really steep canyons and tall sheer cliff faces. And what that kind of ends up looking like really roughly is uh, this map here. So this is a broad, broad idea of where spotted bats might occur in North America. Um, so as you can see here, they go up a bit into Canada, much of the far west US and down into central Mexico as well. Um, so they, they have a wide area that they could potentially be inhabiting. Spotted bats um, are very um, good at social distancing. Um, they were doing it long before it was cool. I know a lot of people when they think about bats, um, they're picturing like a big cave and at sunset, thousands of bats pour out. Um, that's not the way our bats do it here in the Pacific Northwest. And it's especially not the way that spotted bats like to live their lives. Um, they're very solitary. They can actually be really territorial. They are not good at making friends. Um, they also live a lifestyle that means that they're all, not around a lot of other animals either or people except for the occasional rock climber. Um, they like to live in these, roost in these um, really tall cliff faces or small rock crevices in steep canyon walls. Um, so they're just trying to get as far away from pretty much everyone else as possible. Um, they are lepidoptivorous, one of my personal favorite words. Um, Lepidoptera refers to moths and butterflies, and these guys are particularly partial to large high-flying moths. And beyond that, they're even a little bit more picky. Um, like many bats, they don't like to eat the wings of their prey. So they will chew right through the body of that moth and let the, uh, let the wings fall down. Um, I have some fishermen friends who will tell me that there are a few spots that they go out and they'll just have moth wings raining down on them as the bats feed above their heads, um, which is something that I just find so endearing that they're, they're just that picky. Um, so spotted bats, as we mentioned, are elusive. Um, we didn't even think we had spotted bats in Oregon until 1976. Um, and as I proceed, I just wanna let you all know that when I say we, I'm using like the royal we for all of the scientists out there. Um, I have not been studying spotted bats for that long. Um, but the first one was found in 1976 um, out near the Steens Mountains. It was counted, captured in a mist net. Um, and then we went eight years without anyone finding another spotted bat. Um, a mummified individual was found in a little rock crevice um, along the John Day River. Then kind of went radio silent for a while again. Um, in 2003, my boss, uh, Tom Rodhouse, went out with a team of scientists. Actually, they began, began in 2002 um, and went out to do some bat research in the John Day fossil beds area. And over the course of two seasons, they captured three bats, three spotted bats in mist nets, um, just three over the course of two summers. Um, so we're starting to see a little bit of an uptake here in um, the number of spotted bats observed, but it still doesn't seem like we've got a whole lot at this point. Um, flash forward to 2016, we've got this national bat monitoring program, probably less than 100 um, of sample units being checked in Oregon, and spotted bats only found in three of them. Um, and we're gonna dig a little bit more into that national monitoring program, but I just wanted to give you guys an idea of just how, how it seemed like there just weren't any spotted bat populations, really robust populations um, here in Oregon up until that point. Um, but we are going to step in a different direction for just a moment and look at the other side of this project, um, which is citizen science. Uh, what exactly is it? Um, citizen science is the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. Um, so to put it more simply, 
scientists come up with a project and send members of the community out into the natural world to help them collect data. Um, or in some instances, they send information or data packets out to citizens and the citizens sift through that data and help them analyze it. Those are kind of the two main ways that citizen, citizen science gets done. Um, but why bother with citizen science? Why not just have the scientists conduct the research? Um, there's, there's a few reasons for that. The first one is public engagement. Um, a lot of people, when they wanna go spend time outdoors, they're either really task oriented about it, like I'm gonna go hike to this waterfall, or I'm gonna go hunting, or I'm gonna go down this specific mountain bike trail. And they tend to go to the same places over and over again. And citizen science can be a really great opportunity for people to have a reason to go to a spot they've never been before out in nature. Um, so it's just a really good way to get people to kind of interact with their habitat a little bit more and in a new way. Um, we also really appreciate crowdsourced data collection. Um, so science can be very expensive. Um, and so being able to have the community assist us allows us to collect a lot more data. And the more data you, that you have, the more you can use it and the more information you're going to get over time. Um, at the HERS lab, we are all about the applied sciences, gaining information that can help other folks, land managers make decisions. Um, so crowdsourcing the data collection can be really helpful and really expedite um, the process of learning about the species and habitats around us. Um, participation in citizen science has shown to increase scientific literacy in the public. So essentially by participating, people get a better understanding of the scientific process and the rigors that we go to, to get the information that we need. And um, they get a better understanding of how, just how the overall scientific process works. And then that leads into more trust within the public, not just in the realm of whatever project they, they were working on, but because they now better understand how scientists go about collecting and processing data, they have more of an understanding of other scientific th things that come out, especially in like the news media. And I'm sure you can all think of a reason or two why it might be a good idea for people to better understand the scientific process, especially these days. Um, citizen science is nothing new. It has been around for a very long time. Um, one of the biggest success stories is the Christmas bird count. This has been going on since the year 1900, which is just amazing. Um, every year on Christmas day, birders go out and observe, count, and identify as many birds as they can in a given location. In 2019, 80,000 people went out voluntarily on Christmas day and counted 42 million birds in one day. And this has been going on for so long. Um, so it's just, it's really impressive. Um, a kind of more recent success story um, is Frog Watch USA. They've been going for 23 years. They've had 15,000 people go out and collect 160,000 observations about frogs and toads in their region. You might at this point be thinking to yourself, this is amazing. Like that's so much data. Why isn't every single project a citizen science project if you can collect this much information? But there are some caveats when it comes to citizen science and the willingness of people to participate. So that Christmas bird count was started before citizen science was even a term. And the reason that it was able to be so successful is because birding is already a hobby. And I think part of the reason that birding is a hobby and say batting isn't a hobby is that you can walk out your door and see a bird, maybe snap a photo, and you've got a pretty good chance of identifying it. But that is not even remotely the case with bats. I mean, you can get a myotis in your hand. Don't do that. But if you could, you would not be able to tell what species it was just by looking at it. And certainly when they're flying above your head, it's, it's extremely difficult to identify them. They all kind of look the same. It's dark. They're small. 
Um, so for a long time, that data collection has been, there's two main types um, that are done really, really broadly. There's mist netting where people go out and actually capture bats. Um, and then there's um, passive acoustic monitoring. And that's that NA bat monitoring protocol that I alluded to earlier. And it's a really, really technical approach to monitoring. You need specialized equipment. Um, we go out into the field with these ultrasound detectors and we mount microphones on 10 foot poles. Um, and we're using really finicky machines. And what we do is we record bat echolocation calls. Um, and these echolocation calls, the frequency and pattern are unique to each species. So we go out, we set up our detector for a few hours, days, or weeks. Um, fortunately, it's non-invasive. The bats probably don't even notice that the detector is out there. We're not disturbing them. And with this, we're able to do really large scale data collection because we take those, those recordings back to the office and some specialized software and some really intelligent humans go through and are able to tell us which species of bat flew past that detector on that night. Um, and this is being done across the continent every summer, all summer. Um, and it's really fantastic and it has greatly broadened our understanding of bat um, habitat use and occupancy and changes over time. So it's been really fantastic, but there have been some, some suspicions that we might be missing some things with our passive acoustic monitoring and particularly in relation to spotted bats. Um, so there are two reasons why we think we might be underrepresenting spotted bats with our passive acoustic monitoring. The first one is their behavior. So as I discussed, we've got these really dramatic steep cliff faces, um, steep, steep canyons, and the spotted bats tend to like to fly right down the middle of them, but parallel with the top. So they're out flying really high. They're actually flying, we think, outside of the range of our microphone's ability to record them. Um, so that's part of the issue. If we could just hover a microphone out off the, uh, the cliff face, maybe like 30 feet, we might have a better shot. But these guys are just flying so high and they're in such rugged landscapes that we think they might be escaping detection a little bit that way. Then the other way is they're actually their echolocation frequency. So most bats echolocate at a frequency above the range of human hearing. Um, so here we have what we call a sonogram. And um, this axis down here is time in milliseconds. And then this up here is frequency and that's in kilohertz. Um, and I've noted here the upper limit of human hearing. So we can hear things that occur below that line. Um, so up top, I have one of those myotis, the mouse-eared bats, and that's its call. And as you can see, the entirety of its call occurs above the upper limit of human hearing. But down here, we have a spotted bat call, and that's sitting right at 10 kilohertz. That is fairly easy to hear if you have undamaged hearing. Um, so just to give you a little understanding of what that kind of translates to, um, I'm gonna play some calls for you. So the first one I'm gonna play is the myotis call. Now, if this bat were flying above your head, you would not be able to hear a thing, but I've dropped the frequency a little bit so that we can hear it. Um, and this is roughly what it sounds like. So if you had the ears of a bat, that is what you would hear as this guy was out flying around you. But this, as I mentioned, the spotted bat, their call drops below the range, uh, the upper limit of human hearing. And this is what it sounds like completely unedited. Just as it flies past, this is what you'll hear. I don't think we're hearing it unless I'm just not hearing it, which could be very possible. I don't okay. know if that came through. So for folks who are part of this, if it didn't come through, I don't know if there's a way you can send me this slide or a link or somehow get me this audio that I can send out with the recorded content. Um, yeah, Absolutely. people are saying they didn't hear anything. So I, I okay. 
I think we had a technical glitch on how to how to um, get the audio to come through on Zoom. So I apologize, everyone, and we'll figure out how to get that so you can hear it. Yeah, I was. Oh, you know what? Hold on. I might be able to fix this. One moment. Let me try one more time. Yes, we heard that. Oh, okay, excellent. Good job. Thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> Absolutely. So disregard everything I just said. <laughs> um, so that was our, our myotis call with the dropped frequency. And now we'll listen to the spotted bat call as it would be heard um, as the bat flies past. So a little softer, but a very distinctive sound, right? Um, so we think that it's possible that our very specialized equipment that is set up to record the largest number of species might be having a little bit of trouble with these few species that drop below the radar, so to speak, and that frequency is so low that maybe we're not picking it up as often with our highly technical equipment. So that is why- uh, uh, Excuse me, sorry. So you might want to, you're, back, you're in presenter mode um, so we can see your notes, but <laughs> so you might want to click it back to the, to the full view. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My goodness. Yep, that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. So, one second, guys. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. I've been living in the woods all summer. Technology is uh, something I'm sliding back into. Um, and it sent you back. We're looking at your the, all the slides. Yeah, I'm not. Maybe you, do you want to unshare and then just share and then just do it again? Because yeah, I, just thanks like for the heads up. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's try one more time. Okay. All good? All good. Okay. Oh. Nope, but now it's not going to let me. There we go. All right. So, um, we wanted to kind of weave together the traditional passive acoustic monitoring with a new approach that allowed us to more accurately um, locate spotted bats within the landscape. Because um, we, we realized that we were probably underrepresenting them with our traditional methods. So what we ended up doing was using the um, NABAT kind of formula, um, these big grid cells and this randomized order and using that to um, kind of inform where we were going to send our volunteers. And this is kind of what that looked like. So our project encompassed uh, Deschutes, Crook, and Jefferson counties. And within those counties, we chose um, 30 sample units that according to that NA bat monitoring protocol had the highest priority for bat monitoring. Um, so you can see there all the little boxes and they're different colors based on how statistically the important they are um, to the overall project. And then over on the other side, you can see a little bit up closer, um, one of our sample units with the four survey sites that we chose within it. So the sample units are essentially randomly generated um, and they're 10 by 10 kilometers. And then within each of those, we choose four um, survey sites we try to have one in each different quadrant of the survey site. Um, and those are not randomly selected. Those we choose based on habitat features that we think will attract spotted bats to that specific location. So there's a few things we use to determine that. Um, the first one is again, coming back to those sheer cliffs and steep canyons. Um, beyond that, we like to find areas with flat water 
Um, so bats drink on the wing. So while they're flying, so they'll scoop down and get a little sip. Um, there's also a lot of insects above water. So those are really good places to detect bats. Um, and then beyond that, in parts of our survey area that were more heavily forested, we chose areas that uh, maybe had a forest opening, a little meadow, a roadway, even a parking lot sometimes, because being bigger bats, spotted bats do need a bit of room to maneuver while they're flying. Um, so those were kind of our three priorities for choosing sites um, and really zoomed in. That's, this is what that can look like. This is one of our survey sites, Haystack Reservoir. Turned out to be a particularly good site. Um, I surveyed that one myself and had a spotted bat um, clicking over my head as it passed up and down the canyon, um, hunting along that area, which was pretty lovely. Um, so once we had all of our sample units squared away and our study design ready to go, it was time to get the volunteers involved. Uh, the first thing you need to do with any citizen science project is recruit people. So we did a lot of talks like this. Um, there were some articles in, I think, the uh, Ben Bulletin and the source. We reached out to clubs at the local campus, um, OSU Cascades and COCC, um, and tried to essentially get the word out to as many people as possible. Um, and then we lured them into training sessions. Um, so this project took place in 2019 and 2020. In 2019, we were able to have everyone come meet us out at Smith Rock State Park, which is an excellent place to go listen for spotted bats. Um, we went over safety in the field, um, the monitoring protocol, the data sheet. And then once that was all wrapped up, the volunteers were actually able to go sit and listen for spotted bats. And the volunteer coordinator at the time, Trent, was able to go around and make sure that they were actually hearing bats when they flew by. That was kind of the, the testing part of it, just to make sure um, not everyone has the sharpest hearing in the world. Um, so to make sure that everyone was ready to go and knew what they were looking for. Um, of course, in 2020, things were a little different. Um, I was not able to gather a group of volunteers together. Um, so I made a training uh, presentation, again, very similar to this. It was the time of Zoom. Um, and we went over all of the same things. And then I played them a whole bunch of spotted bat calls and then a bunch of other sounds like crickets and other insects and birds and things that they might hear at night. Um, to make sure that they could really distinguish between those two different kinds of sounds. Um, and after that, I was real mean and I made them take a quiz online to absolutely ensure that they knew what they were doing when they headed out into the field. Um, and fortunately, all but one of my, uh, my trainees um, passed the quiz. I think there was one gentleman who maybe his hearing wasn't quite as sharp as he thought it was, um, which you know, was bound to happen. So um, all in all, pretty successful in that regard. Um, so after all the training is done, then it kind of gets more to the fun part. So we had our 30 sample units, each with four sites. And in an ideal world, each of those sites would have been surveyed once in June, once in July, and once in August. Um, that would be really ambitious, 360 surveys over the course of the summer. Um, maybe we'll get there eventually. Um, but we had our volunteers go through and select which surveys they wanted to conduct. So we had an online sign-up sheet that had a nice interactive map. It, you could see road layers, topography layers, all this stuff because our sites ran the absolute gambit. Some of them were right inside the city of Prineville and others required a two day backpacking trip. Um, so they were kind of all over the place. So people could select the sites based on accessibility, how much they wanted to hike, what part of the Tri-County area they wanted to explore. Um, I tried to provide them with some notes about what I expected the road quality to be like in case not everyone drives a super rugged off-road vehicle. Um, 
and we let them go through and pick which sites they wanted to do and which month they wanted to do them. Um, after that, it was all about communication. So they would sign up on the website. They would also let me know where they were planning to go and when. And then the night of the survey, I would have the volunteers text me or email me or call me, let me know that they were heading out. And the agreement was that when they got back home or back to wherever, you know, safety was, they would text me again to let me know. So all summer long, I had all these reminders on my phone to make sure that my volunteers were getting back um, safe and sound as the idea of sending people out into the wilderness in the dark, um, you know, it just, it needs a lot of, you have to build a lot of safety protocols into something like that, which is something anyone should keep in mind when planning a citizen science project. Um, so once they've let me know that they're heading out into the field, it's time to drive and maybe hike out to their survey locations. Um, they were required to do this during daylight. Um, so they did have to head out a little while before their survey was going to start just to make sure that they familiarized themselves with the area. Um, because of course, our spotted bats don't make it easy. They want you to be sitting at the top of a cliff to listen for them. Um, so people needed to go out and really familiarize themselves with their survey site um, before the before all the light went away. Um, and then is the, the exceptionally fun part, which is going out and often to just extremely beautiful locations and sitting quietly for an hour um, after sunset to listen for bats. Um, a lot of times we didn't get to hear anything. I did a lot of the surveys as well, and sometimes that's just how it goes, but um, nevertheless, it was often really beautiful, although sometimes a little less so, um, but my volunteers were amazing and they never complained about having to go sit out in the scrubby desert for an hour at night and listen, um, which I just, I greatly appreciate. It was, and I assumed everyone would all just choose all the prettiest places and they didn't. They went where they thought they were going to hear bats, um, which was pretty fantastic. Um, over the course of two summers, 61 hours of surveying was completed um, with the help of 12 volunteers. We managed to get surveys done in 20 of our 30 sample units, which um, was pretty exciting for us. Um, again, I thought people would kind of cluster into the more like charismatic, pretty places that they already like to go, um, but they didn't. They really, they spread out quite a bit, um, which was great. And over those two summers, we had 25, like definitely there were spotted bat encounters. Um, so that was really, really encouraging. Um, this actually greatly increased our detection rate of spotted bats in Central Oregon. So in, um, in the two summers that we did this project, we increased the number of spotted bat um, confirmed hearings, I guess, um, by 33% compared to the previous four years of passive acoustic monitoring. Um, so that really kind of speaks to the efficacy of this, uh, this project design. Um, this provided us with evidence of correlation with rock features. So um, something like 69% of our survey sites that had prominent rock features within them um, had spotted bats detected. Um, so that was pretty exciting, kind of just confirming what we've all been assuming about spotted bats. Um, and then there was this nice little detection probability correlation. So we have a heat map here um, that shows where we think spotted bats are going to be based on kind of some historic data. And we were really able to kind of confirm some of the things that we already thought and then also refine that map um, and get a little bit more specific with it. If you think back to that really blobby range map we had at the beginning of the presentation, um, we're now kind of narrowing down and really honing in on what kind of habitat the spotted bats are using, um, which is just fantastic. Um, so big picture, what does all of this mean? Um, we've got proof of concept for our project design. We've got um, confirmation of some of our previous assumptions of where spotted, spotted bats are um, roosting, where they're foraging. We've got evidence maybe against some of our other assumptions, especially some of our more limiting assumptions. 
about what, where we think spotted bats were not previously. Um, and then of course, there's always a need for more knowledge. Um, so first, the, the proof of concept. So audible bat presence can be monitored using RL surveys. We had a higher success rate sending individuals out um, to listen for bats than we do with our passive acoustic monitors. And this is especially important because spotted bats are not the only um, underrepresented species in the world. Um, we think that it's possible that our other audible bat species, um, some Molossidae and maybe even the pallid bat are being underrepresented by passive acoustics. So this type of project could be applied in other areas to other species. Um, we also think that this could be scaled up and maybe across the spotted bat range projects like this could go on and we could get a better understanding. And again, refine those range maps to really understand um, what areas the spotted bats are utilizing. Um, altered assumptions. We, we don't know what we don't know. Um, so we did find that, you know, the assumption that spotted bats need cliffs. Yeah, they, they definitely seem to have a strong correlation with cliffs. But there was also an assumption previously that spotted bats didn't go into higher elevation areas. And we were surprised to find that people were hearing them a little ways up into the Cascades above where we previously thought. Um, so their range might even be larger than we originally suspected. Um, there was also a really um, strong correlation between spotted bats and dry forests, which again is kind of confirming our old assumptions. Um, but then there was actually a really interesting inverse correlation um, with areas of increased rainfall. We didn't find spotted bats in those places. Um, so they might really actually require um, super dry areas. Um, so that was, that was an interesting little tidbit for us to take away. Um, but of course, we, we need to learn more. This was a really small project, um, just two years, and partly because of um, the goings on in the world, not as many surveys were done as maybe could have been. Um, a lot of people were overwhelmed with um, Zoom activities when I was trying to do the trainings, um, and just life was a little chaotic last summer. So. Um, there is, of course, a need for more research. We are hoping to start this project up again in the relatively near future, if at all possible, because um, we, we acknowledge that there's much we still don't know about spotted bats, and we probably won't for some time, um, but a citizen science, a really robust citizen science effort um, could help us to kind of fill in those missing puzzle pieces with regards to this um, species. And with that, here's my little sales pitch. Um, like I said, we are hoping that at some point in the near future, we will be able to um, kickstart this project again and maybe even expand it. So if you're even remotely interested in helping in the future, or if you just want to kind of keep track of things, um, get updates on, this project and future projects regarding spotted bats, you feel free to email me. I've got a running list of um, folks who might want to volunteer in the future um, and you will not be forgotten um, if you reach out. Luckily, my name is super easy to spell. Um, I'm just sarah.rose at osucascades.edu. Um, and I have so many things to give. Um, first to my volunteers who put up with my silly online quizzes and hiked out into random places and just really inherently trusted me to send them um, to safety, to safe places. Um, I really appreciated them so much. Um, some of those volunteers were my coworkers that I very politely asked to help with surveys. Um, I need to thank Tom Rodhouse. He was the PI on this project and he is just an enigmatic hummingbird of a human who um, is chock full of ideas and energy and is always inspiring. Um, and then of course, our funding sources, the National Park Service, the US Forest Service, 
Bureau of Land Management and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, projects like this obviously would not be possible um, without the alphabet soup kicking in a few dollars. So we, we really, really appreciate it. Um, and again, if you need any more information, I am reachable and we also have a website. Um, and as you can see here, this is, this is a uh, Tom Rod house, which is one of my favorite photos of him. Um, and with that, I'm, uh, I'm all done. Great. Thank you. Um, so let's move into some questions. We did have a few come through. Um, so First question was, do spotted bats migrate or are they in Oregon all year? Um, we believe that they do migrate seasonally or at least some individuals will. Um, it's going to depend very much on local conditions. Some of them, in, as opposed to hibernating, will go into torpor, which is kind of similar um, to hibernation. Um, so that's an it depends kind of question. Interesting, thank you. <laughs> Um, one person wanted to know, is there a way to attract bats to their property? They sound like they have quite a few acres and wanted to put up a bat house or do something to really help attract bats to their property. Is that something that's possible, um, especially with spotted bats? It is actually. Um, so one of the biggest things you can do is actually plant native wildflowers. Um, that will attract native insects to your yard, which will in turn attract bats. Um, a bat house is not a bad idea, but you definitely want to do your research. Um, shape, color, and design all kind of vary based on your specific location, um, shade levels, sunlight levels, all those kinds of things. Um, bat Conservation International is a really good resource for that. Um, but otherwise, I've actually heard of folks putting out um, lights in places on their property to attract insects who in turn attract bats. Um, there's some controversy around that. Um, so my, my thing would always be just native wildflowers are gonna be your best bet for getting some bats. Um, and if you're not in the desert, um, maybe a little pond as well, cause then they can come down and drink in your yard. And that's just so fun to watch. That's great, thank you. Yeah. Um, one person wanted to know, are spotted bat calls heard with bat detectors or is their call too low? We do pick them up with our bat detectors for sure. The sound file that I played came from a bat detector. Um, we just suspect that we might be missing some of them, but not all of them. Great, thank you. Um, I'm curious, you had listed the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as a funder, so I assume some form of a partner. Do you happen to know are, did they have a similar effort? Is all, are all their efforts being driven through this particular project or do you happen to know what other things they might be doing in way of spotted bat monitoring and habitat protect? I don't know, anything related that the agency is doing because I haven't heard much about it and I, I think it's, it's listed as a sensitive species. So I was just curious if what their role in any of this is. Yeah, I mean, they participate a lot. They're one of our biggest partners for the NA bat monitoring. So for the large scale um, passive acoustics, as far as I know, that's the extent of it. Um, but I am not the one who's generally like in contact with the agency partners. I'm, I'm the boots on the ground person who's out running around. Um, so I'm not 100% sure. I have not heard any stirrings about like specifically conserving spotted bat habitat. Um, fortunately for them, the places they like to live are the kinds of places that can't really be developed. Um, Good point. So I think that's working in their favor at this point. Yeah, because another question was going to be, what, other, what are the limiting factors to them being able to thrive, whether it's habitat or food source or what have you? So it sounds like habitat's not one of them. Yeah, I would assume that habitat is not one of them. Um, one thing I would be, I'm particularly concerned about is the use of like commercial pesticides, um, especially as we live in an agricultural area and they feed on moths, which can be considered a pest species. Um, so I would, that would probably be a limiting factor. Um, you know, in places, like I mentioned, Smith Rock is really great um, for listening for spotted bats, but 
I've, I've often been concerned about the number of people up on the walls climbing, um, and that could actually be keeping spotted bats from roosting in that kind of habitat. Um, so too much recreation in some areas cause, could cause a problem. Um, those would be my two kind of main concerns. Do you have any sense of how climate change is impacting the species? Honestly, I don't think we have enough data really, like long-term data to understand that. Um, we're just starting to get a real sense of where our spotted bats are in the first place. And um, in order to understand, you know, the impacts of climate change, you need to see data over time. Um, you know, one concern is always going to be water sources, and especially like clean, still water sources. Um, these guys, you know, they live above these raging rivers, so they actually have to find somewhere to drink water away from that that big river. So they need those small ponds and things like that that tend to dry up in, in years like this one. Um, so it, it is possible that they will be impacted. Um, fortunately, they don't they don't need much in the way of water. They don't need a snowy winter. Um, so yeah, yeah, we'll see. Great. Um, somebody asks, I know one issue with the bat detectors is that detections are better for judging presence than abundance. Is that assumption different with in-person surveys? No, that assumption is very similar with in-person surveys. The one thing um, that could be different is when you're listening in person, you, can, you have directional hearing. Um, so I can hear about come from this direction and fly across and go off that way. So then if I hear another bat come from this direction and go off that way, I know it's not the same bat just flying past me again. Whereas with the detector, you wouldn't know that. Um, so there is some potential there to kind of increase our understanding of abundance, but um, that person is right. We primarily use acoustics for presence as opposed to abundance. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe just for kind of a bats 101. Do you know how many species Oregon has of native bats? Approximately 15. Oh, wow. Yeah. How, do you have a sense of how, and not necessarily going into each one, but how, and I know some of the challenge, of course, is you're all trying to figure out what is sort of the status <laughs> of the spotted bat population, but do you have a sense of how they're faring uh, to each other? Are there some that are not doing so great? I, I don't know, is there, or is, the rest of the species still struggling, or these other species struggling as well to have enough information as well to understand, you know, how they're faring. Yeah, so um, I do know that we have, we have a few sensitive species here in Oregon. I believe that the Townsend's Big Eared um, and the hoary bat is one that we're concerned about. Um, they're pr um, particularly susceptible to issues with wind turbines. Um, so we do have a few species that we are concerned about. Um, and one of the challenges that our bats here in the Pacific Northwest pose is that they don't roost in these big, huge colonies. Um, so trying to find um, roosts and hibernacula to go get accurate counts can be pretty difficult because um, they're all fairly antisocial. Um, so that's that's been like an ongoing um, difficulty with really getting an idea. Um, but we are able with our passive acoustics to see changes in the number of calls over time or changes in, you know, whether or not a bat, bats of a certain species are still showing up at a given location. So we can track trends, um, just not maybe not abundance as accurately as other things, but we can still start, start to get an idea of these um, kind of shifting patterns. Um, and this broad scale um, monitoring has been going on for enough years now that we're, we're just starting to kind of really dig into those patterns um, and see who might, who might be in trouble and who's doing all right. We have been considerably lucky um, in the face of white nose syndrome, which I'm not sure folks are familiar. Um, but white nose syndrome is a, a fungal infection that has been really decimating bats um, in the eastern U.S. And due to their antisocial nature, our bats have not yet um, been impacted by white nose syndrome, which is really fortunate. Um, but that's part of my, my year-long um, passive acoustic monitoring system that we're setting up right now is trying to get a better understanding of those patterns and those changes over time. 
That's great. Yeah. You meet somebody, to, they literally just asked that question. So you, <laughs> you got them right there. Um, and then I think this will be the final question, um, just in being interest of time. Do you have any recommendations for societies or organizations that might offer educational opportunities or trainings on surveying bats or bat biology and detection methods? Ooh, okay. Um, so the biggest one that I can give a shout out for is Bat Conservation International. Um, they have a crazy amount of information that's very like um, kind of accessible to the public. It's easy to digest. Um, and I don't know about like trainings, as far as I know, there's there's really not much citizen science going on with relation to bats in the US. Um, there is some stuff going on in Europe, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but I can tell you that if, if you're just curious about the bats, um, maybe where you live or where you recreate, there is, and I won't remember the name of it, but it's Googleable. There's a little device that you can plug into your phone and it's essentially um, an ultrasound detector. And if a bat flies by, it'll tell you what species it is. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool. I think it's like a hundred bucks. Um, so you can like go be your own bat biologist. Um, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. Yep. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your presentation. I mean, I definitely learned a lot, so I appreciate it. And I hope all the <laughs> listeners tonight did as well. Again, this recording will be available tomorrow. And if you did participate in the raffle, we will be notifying the winners tomorrow. So thank you again, Sarah. Thanks for all your work. And hopefully that really leads to a bigger wealth of knowledge about this incredible species. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Have a great night.